Praise the Lord. I kind of felt that we were kind of up against the wall tonight. And that last song, kind of like something's got to break. <laughs> something's got to break. You know, we, we create the atmosphere. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's here whether you recognize it or not. Our job, we, we, this is lesson number four on praise and worship, and our job is to seek him out. Sometimes it takes a little bit of work. We didn't have a regular accompaniment tonight. We didn't have, you know, pra four praise singers up here and all this other stuff, and sometimes it's the sacrifice of praise. What was that Michael W. Smith song? It's more than a song. It's more than a song. He wants more than a song. <laughs> praise God. Amen. We're the sacrifice. Amen. Amen. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Praise God. Well, welcome. Amen. Midweek Bible study. Praise God. The last lesson of four on praise and worship. Amen. Does everyone have a lesson? We're going to start with there. Any, no one, does, it, does anyone not have one? Raise your hand. Sister, Sister Barb needs one over here. And does everyone have a pen or a pencil, a writing device that you can kind of fill in the blanks? That's where we're going to start tonight. Amen. Praise God. Everyone's ready to go. That's what I like to see. Amen. Just turn around, shake someone's hand, and welcome to Hope City Church. Tell them you're glad to see them. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Glory, glory. So glad you're here. Lesson 15 on praise and worship. The lesson is titled Maintaining Order in Worship. Now, sometimes I kind of wish that there was a little more disorder, <laughs> that we would kind of cut it loose a little bit more than we do. But as you can see, there's 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 40 says, let all things be done decently ordered. So there's got to be an order to it. Uh, as part, by the, some of our previous lessons, our pastor said, we, you know, we are not idiots and we don't have to act like idiots. We should, we should worship in spirit and in truth, right? So there's got to be an order. So it says that God's creation is filled with diversity and continual change. We've talked about that all the time. Change is constant. You can resist it all you want, but change is constant. But at the same time, it's controlled by divine order. God is deliberate in what he does, and he does not make random decisions based on whims or moods. Now, that's our problem, right? I'm tired. I come to church, and I'm tired. I, I come to church, and I'm not feeling real well. I'm, I come to church, and then, so it's our moods and our emotions get in the way. But that God is not like that. Right? There's a prevailing coherence and consisting in creation in God's eyes. So God has allowed us great variety in worship. It could be verbal expressions. It could be demonstrative physical displays. We've talked about that. Uh, playing of musical instruments, singing, and even silence. Even though worship is a free expression and should be done with enthusiastic vigor, there still are some parameters of control. There's still a prevailing divine order in worship based on principles found in God's word. Aren't you glad for that? We don't have to make this stuff up. What we do in our church services and our orders are, are scriptural. Someone's first time comes into an apostolic or Pentecostal church and they, don't, they, they, they feel something, but they've never seen something going on like we do. And we, we ought to have a few scriptures perhaps in the back of our Bible and say, well, look at just in case you're wondering, here it says, clap your hands, all you people. Here it says, make a joyful noise. And there is a dance of the Lord. And, you know, some praise with and everything that had breath, praise the Lord. So we should have a few of these things in our back pocket when we want to explain to people that we're not idiots, we're not crazy, we're worshiping God divinely, right? <laughs> all right. So, number one, biblical examples of order. Now, we know that God maintains order in heaven, right? That's the ultimate position. We're striving for heaven. We want to make heaven our home, do we not? All right, and so there's going to be an order to things in heaven as well, right? Number one, Lucifer's rebellion, our first word, rebellion, put him in conflict with and in opposition to heaven's divine order and therefore God. He opposed God himself. He said, I will be like the most high God, right? 
Number two, as a result of his rebellion, Lucifer was expelled. Expelled. Along with his entourage of disorderly and rebellious angels. It's talked about in Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28. If you want to read that sometimes. I, those are fascinating stories about the spirit of the Antichrist. You want to know what, what's coming down the pike here. It's that same spirit, right? We all want to be gods in our natural order of things. But that's not God's plan for us, right? Number three. This expulsion indicates to us God's resolve to maintain order. Any time, anything besides God being worshipped is out of order. Those become idols in our life. We become, we worship and set something being between us and God. It becomes an idol. That disrupts the order and the plan of God for our lives, right? B. We find that there was order in all of God's works in the Old Testament. See, there's a pattern here. We can go to the Old Testament, go to the New Testament. He said, I didn't come to change the law. I'm the fulfillment of the law. So the things in the Old Testament are still schoolmasters. that can, We can learn some things about God from there, right? So the law was a complete system containing rules of what? Order. It had the priesthood. It had the tabernacle layout. The order of the Israelite camp, the dietary laws, it had the ceremonial laws, it had the civil laws, and so on. There was order. God had a plan. Everything the Israelites did was controlled by divine, divine order. No chaos in heaven. God gave us complete detailed instructions concerning what he wanted from the Israelites, and he did not leave any room for inventions, right? Nothing was left to the imaginations. They had to do it. They had to build it, but it was according to God's plan. All right? Patterns, shadows, and examples. Amen. Number two, when God gave Israel special deliverance from their enemies, he gave order even to their battle plan. What did it say? Who, who led Israel into the, arm, into the warfare? It was always the tribe of Judah. Praise went before the other the 11 tribes. There was an order to what God wanted them to do. A, the walls of Jericho fell after Israel's obedience. Obedience to God's very explicit and detailed instructions. What did he tell them to do? I want you to march around the walls of Jericho. I want you to do it for six days. They're probably thinking, what are you doing? On the seventh day, I want you to go around seven times. <coughs> and when they blow the trumpet, I want you to shout. And the walls came down, right? B, Gideon defeated the Mennonites with 300 men whose only weapons were trumpets and pitchers and lamps and their vocal cords because they acted what? In obedience to God's instructions. Isn't it amazing what happens when we follow God's instructions? It brings order to our own life. C, both of these victories came as a result of their harmony and with obedience to God's battle strategy. He's got a plan for each and every one of us. He teaches us. He tells us how to have victory in our life. We don't have to make it up. We can go to the scriptures. We go to the word of God, and he will lead us to victory. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5, very familiar scriptures. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not physical. But mighty through God to the pulling of the strongholds. And then he describes and defines these strongholds, the things that we're really going to wrestle with. Casting down our imaginations. Our imaginations run wild, do they not? To bring down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Those would be the idols in our life. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's God's battle plan for us today. Very, very scriptural. Spiritual victory will come in our services and in your personal life, my mind add, when we are sensitive to the Holy Ghost and obedient to its instructions, which create a spiritual direction and order in our services. God has a plan for each of us. C, God's word ordains and gives instructions on order in our home. So it goes beyond the church service, right? It goes into our home. 
Number one, the Christian family should be a holy, a holy institution of order and love and divine authority. Our home should be governed by God's principles. Number two, scripturally, order, order in the home is structured as follows. So God's got an order in heaven. He's going to have an order in our home. He's going to have an order in our service. A, the head of every man is Christ. B, the head of every woman is the man. 1 Corinthians 11 and 3. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of every woman is the man and the head of Christ is God. C, children are under the authority of their parents and are commanded to obey their parents in the Lord. Parents, Ephesians 6, verses 1 and 2. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise. So it's all the way, he's drawing from the Old Testament. Go back and read that commandment. It's the first commandment with promise. D, God demands that there be order in church. 1 Corinthians Chapter 12, verses 12 through 31. I went and looked at a part of this. It's talking about all the parts of the body. Our pastor's taught about this numerous times. All the moving parts of our body, right? I'm not the hand, I'm not the eye, I'm not the foot, but I'm this and I'm that. And how they somehow in a service, they should all come together. And that there would be order. And everyone, what, plays their part so that the whole body's lifted up, right? I'm so glad that Crystal can lead us into worship. I'm so glad we have a pastor who can speak into our life and preach the word, right? That's their role. That's a responsible. We have the same one. We have ushers. We have greeters. We have people in the audiovisual department. We have people in the coffee shop (laughs) serving, making Hope City a great place to come. Amen. Inviting atmosphere. Praise God. And number one, Paul compared the, the church to the human body, and each person in the church should function harmoniously together, right, as a particular member of the body of which Christ is the head. We, not, we cannot forget that. He is the head. We are part of that body, but he leads us. We need to follow him. Number two, there are a variety of spiritual gifts and diversity of operations. We know all about that, right? Yet all of them come from the same, the same, the same spirit. There's no division in heaven and are subject to authority. Everything that is of God will be controlled by God and will operate within God's Prescribed order. There's an order to everything. A, the purpose of spiritual gifts is to exhort, to edify, to comfort the church. What we do is to build up and encourage the body of believers, the church, the ecclesia, right? The called out. B, Even though a person is used by God in the operation of spiritual gifts, the nine spiritual gifts laid out, that person is still subject to the order of God's word. See, everything must be judged by the word of God. It's the final authority for everything we do. When we have questions, we go to the author and the finisher of our faith. I love it. I love it. I love it. There's no no unanswered questions there. Number C, in spiritual gifts, we are not... To be used, we are not to use God, but rather are we to be used by God. I I think this is a failing many, many, many times in the church. The Bible says we have spiritual gifts, and it says severally. That that implies not two, but at least three, several, right? And so the question I always ask people is, what are your spiritual gifts? What would God really do with you and what would he do with me if we would allow him, if we truly would be led by the Spirit? Because we have those gifts. We just have to believe. We have to step out in faith. All that we get all, we get really uncomfortable when, when, when we're asked to do certain things, right? <laughs> and it might be by our pastor, but it might be God himself. I was sitting on an airplane. I went back from Tucson, and I was sitting next to this, this man. I will not even describe him, right? but he was very unusual. And something in me just said, 
you ought to talk to this man. And I, I went, what? <laughs> I didn't. I, I, but I felt this unction that I need to start a conversation with him. And I just thought, man, where, where, where do I start that? Ah, there you go. But that's how God works, is it not? Praise God. D, operating in the spiritual realm does not mean we are lifted into a new dimension that releases us from the laws of divine order. We're not released from that. We still have to operate in order. All right? We're never, never, never above or exempted from God's laws of order. It just will not happen. If you're doing something outside the word or outside the... Then, then you're wrong. I'm wrong when we do that, all right? E, spiritual gifts should function in an orderly, an orderly fashion for the purpose of edifying the body of Christ. Individually, we are specialized. We are all unique beings. We're all different. We have a unique DNA. We have unique fingerprints. We are unique. We No, there's not two people in here that are the same. But individually, we have to come together Amen. Edify the body of Christ. And we are to be organized. The last blank there is organized. Number three, an uncontrolled service that is without rules. Just read the Bible. Now, some of these things that Paul was writing to the Corinthians was because there was chaos going on in the church. Everybody had a gift. Everybody wanted to use it. <laughs> he was saying, wait a minute. We're going to put some order to this tongues and interpretation and prophecies things. Two or three speak and then someone interpret. And if there's no interpreter then, then don't say anything. That's what was going on when he gave order to our church services. It's because this was new. It was a new dimension. Before it was all the priest jobs, right? The high priest, the political priesthood. This is where they're, that's why that was our model. They had nothing to equate it to with. Now all of a sudden we're a part of this royal priesthood and I've got to learn how to function in the Holy Ghost. It took some teaching. It took some Paul. It took some pastors to teach and speak into these people's lives. Praise God. I love it. It's a dangerous thing to think that because our activity is anointed, here we go, that there are no limitations or no restraints. It's just not possible. There, that there wouldn't be any restraints on us because I'm operating in the Holy Ghost. I can do whatever I want. Hmm? Be careful. <laughs> And I'm thankful. I don't. I think very. We we have very organized services. I appreciate the one time when when, when the young kids were stopping in here and he shut down the nursery and they, he got a look at it and our pastor said, "Hey man, this is how, this is how we're going to do church services with our kids in here, right?" I really appreciate that. That gave some order. All right, I love it. God expects a God expects everyone to be in order and subject to spiritual authority. And here we go again. All right, be everyone regardless of what they feel are still subject to those in authority in the church. We're never going to lose that, right? Worshiping and the moving of God's spirits does not release us from those authorities, right? I, I've been in services, maybe, maybe you haven't been, where someone will be giving tongues or interpretation or somebody doing this, and the, and the, the, the minister and the pulpit will say, hey, wait a minute, no, no, we're not going to do that now, right? They're still under authority, and, and we need to learn to submit to that, right? Even the operation of the spiritual gifts is subject to the pastor of the spiritual board, Right? So I've been blessed with the gift of tongues and interpretation and prophecy occasionally. And sometimes early in the service, I will feel it. God will say, hey, you're, you, you, and, and then I'll, now I'm exercising discipline in my life and saying, now I, I need to respect the pastor and the, and the service order. And so now I've got to wait for an opportunity to, for that to unfold. And if it doesn't, then it doesn't happen. I'm subject to the spiritual authority standing in the pulpit, right? That's how the spiritual gifts operate, right? So number two, understanding the authority of the worship leader. And I'm just glad we have a great worship leader, Sister Crystal, right? Hebrews 13 and verse 17 says, Obey them that have rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they must give an account, and they may do it with joy and not with grief, and that is unprofitable for you. So again, we have these spiritual authorities in us, right? In our lives. So A says, God and the pastor delegate to the worship leader. So Crystal's role here, she's delegated a role and responsibility in her services to match that person's responsibility, right? Number one, the worship leader is responsible for the progress of the service. The progress of the service. And this authority 
in the execution of that response will be less respected. So when Sister Crystal or whoever's standing here would encourage us, come on, let's lift our hands. Let's come on, let's continue to worship. Come on, let's there's something here. God's beginning to move. Let's let's not lay, you know, let's not sit down on God. But we're supposed to follow his or her lead. All right. Number two, God will not inspire that person to do anything against the authority that he ordains, though. So even Crystal is subject to a higher authority, the pastor who's given that responsibility and authority. And so we got to learn to understand the difference between emotions and spirit, right? I love to worship God, whether I'm worshiping and in joy, whether I'm weeping in tears and the thankfulness of what God's done in my life. I, you still have to say I'm in a church service and there's something going on here that's bigger than me. And we have to recognize and respond to that, what God's trying to do, whether it's in tongues, interpretation or prophecy. Sometimes it's, as I talked about just a few minutes ago, sometimes it's the timing of when we do things in a church service. God still wants to use us, but, but there's an order to everything we do, right? A, we must remain subject to those in authority even when you're worshiping God. Even when we're worshiping God, right? Now, there's nothing wrong with getting lost in the Holy Ghost, right? But that that sin does not mean you get to lose your submission to the Spirit's authority. Listen to what the person in the pulpit, whether it's the worship leader or the pastor, what they're trying to do. They may call their attention. Maybe they're exhorting. Maybe they're trying to speak into someone's life as, a, as the Holy Ghost is leading them, right? So the, the, the scripture said the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. Yeah? We're supposed to have control of that, which is going on in our life, right? God wants to use me, but that gift is still subject to me. And my job is to use it decently in order, right? As God would permit, all right? So B, if you rebel against the authority, you rebel against God himself. You cannot be in the spirit at the same time you rebel in the spirit of rebellion or disobedience. It's just, it's not, it's just not going to happen, right? And sometimes, I mean, I, I've seen it. And, and generally, the minister will speak to someone following a service and say, hey, you know, this is what I saw going up above. So he's kind and gentle and he's, he's shepherding people and, and that's how we'd want it to be, right? All right? We have a lovely pastor who loves each and every one of us. All right? Three, if we have a godly spirit of obedience, we will willingly submit to God's delegated or designated authority. Authority. See, if we were truly led by the spirit of God, we will never be out of order because God is not the author of confusion. <laughs> All right? James 3 and 16 says, for we're envying and strife is there is confusion in every evil work now this this word strife in james 3 16 speaks of electioneering it's, it's kind of campaigning right or intriguing for office a desire to put oneself forward a partisan and fractious spirit that does not disdain the low arts and so people who are not willing to submit authority they're trying to draw attention to themselves look at me i have this gift i have this calling i can be used of god too right that's conflicting with the spiritual authority that god set in the order in the church service and it's not of god right so b we are to respect respect and honor all authority respect and honor all authority Number one, all those in authority are ministers of God. The Bible says God sets up and God takes down within the scope of their delegated work. They're not equal to the pastor or God called preachers, but are under their direction and must remain subject to them. So we all have positions. We have, we have ministerial leaders, and, but they're all subject to the pastoral and the word of God. Number two, if we are to submit to the world's order, how much more are we to submit to the person in charge of our worship service, right? Hmm? Hmm? See, the pastor's talked about this. We can either help or hinder them, right? Yeah, we can, we can sit on God. Oh, I'm kind of tired. Oh, it was 100 degrees outside. I'm, I'm kind of whipped today. And, you know, I had a long day at work, and you don't know what happened on the, you know, on the job site and the, the kids at home and this and all this stuff going on. And instead of saying, look, it, I've come here I'm going to bring every thought into captivity. We talked about that earlier. I'm going to give God his time, and I'm going to give God his glory, right? 
See, the, the worship leader is just trying to lead us into the presence of God. And what a blessing that is when we, when we enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Now we're in the presence of God, and now everything's made new again, right? And we're refreshed in the Holy Ghost, and here we go again, right? <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> I'm a new person in Christ Jesus, right? Here we go. So the key to church experience the powerful move of God is that they follow the leading of the Spirit together in the directions of the worship leader. Just do that and honor our worship leader when we come together. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 22 and 23, it says, And Samuel said, I think he was talking to Saul here, Hath the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? Saul gave the sacrifices, but he didn't obey the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness as iniquity of, and idolatry because thou has rejected the word, our ultimate authority, right? Because thou has rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected thee from being king. That one incident in Saul's life spoke to him. God asked him to do something and he thought he had a better idea. And he did it and God said, nah, da, 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 that's not what I asked you to do. I asked you to utterly destroy them. And Saul didn't, all right? Number three, when someone ignores or shows disrespect for the leadership in a worship service, he manifests a spirit of rebellion, a spirit of rebellion, not against that person, but against God himself, because these authorities are ordained by God, right? So there's really no excuse for disorder or disobedience in a church service. And I don't know that we have any, but part of the lesson, and these are things we can carry with us in every area of our life. Luke 10 and 16 says, He that heareth you, heareth me, and he that despises you, despises me, and he that despises me, despises him that sent me. These are the words of Jesus. And see, it's, it is important for us to remember that regardless of the intensity of our experience with worship, We've had plenty of those, right, as individuals. We never become exempt from the authority of the worship leader, the worship leader, and the pastor of the authorities in that service. It's just, it is not going to happen. We can have a great time, and God wants to, us to worship him and lift him up and experience. We're, we're going to have a presence of God here so that people who have never experienced what we've experienced can feel the presence of God, and God can be do a, begin to work in their life. That's how it works. We, it was that way for me. And I'm sure it was that way with you the first time we expended the presence of God. I was, it was in uh, Arizona with Will, and we were talking about God. It just comes up inevitably. And I talked about feeling the presence of God for the very first time. And I said, Will, I didn't understand it. I didn't understand it, but I felt something I'd never felt before. And it was the presence of God. And then when I learned how to worship, and then I understood what they were doing was Bible, then one thing, it was line upon line, and here a little bit, and there a little bit. And that's how God works in our lives. God's going to do it. God's going to do it. Praise God. <coughs> Number one, the same truth applies to the operation of spiritual gifts. And we've talked about that already. Whatever's going to happen in a service, there should be an order to it. God wants to move. He will find. He will move if we don't get in the way, right? Number two, we cannot become so caught up with our own personal experience that we become detached from what the Holy Ghost is doing for the church collectively. I think occasionally we got to open our eyes and turn around and say, what's God trying to do? Oh, that person behind me, three rows behind me, is weeping and crying. The guests and the visitor, God's doing something in their life. Maybe I should go back there and pray with them. Maybe I should ask if I could pray with them. Maybe I should ask what they're experiencing. Now, okay, now all of a sudden we're out of our comfort zone, right? But that's order in a service. When God begins to move during a worship service, then we ought to move with God, right? Give him an opportunity. We should never hinder the spirit of God, but we shouldn't, do, and we shouldn't do anything with draw undue intention to ourselves, but politely step out in your aisle and go back and praying with someone is not disrupting anyone. It'll be a blessing, and you don't know you could be opening the door to a mighty move of God in our services, right? Number three, we must strive to harmonize, harmonize with the spirit of the service. It 
and the direction given by the leadership. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 32 and 33. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. He's talking about us, right? They, too, must exercise self-control, right? See, those, number four, those who are anointed or inspired to have the responsibility, responsibility to exercise their liberty in an appropriate, harmonious, and beneficial way. Confusion is always a result of the human vehicle. The flesh, the flesh, the flesh, the flesh. If there's a problem, it's not the Holy Ghost's fault. The Spirit of God will never create a discordant atmosphere. Not God's will, not God's purpose. He's trying to bring us together into unity of the faith. He's never going to do anything that pulls us apart. E, a maverick, independent attitude will hinder our ability to worship. When you start worrying about other people and thinking about this and thinking about that instead of the presence of God and entertaining and seeing how I might be used in, in our service tonight or Sunday morning or whatever it is, we've got to be sensitive to that. Number one, if we yield to the Holy Ghost and are submissive to godly leaders, they will not have to worry about getting out of order. Out of order? Order. Number two, when worshiping alone, I hope you worship alone. I hope this is not the only time you lift your hands. When we worship alone, we can become oblivious to our surroundings. Because now you're in the presence with God, one-on-one. You can do, you can dance, you can cry, you can do somersaults, you can do whatever you want. But when worshiping with the group, then we must consider the group. And we must understand that we are a collective body of Christ. And then we come together for congregational worship. We must blend together so that we then we don't appear to be as idiots to those that might be watching us. We want to be able to take them to the scripture and say, this is what we do and this is why we do it. We're in the word. And then they either agree with it or don't. All right? F, freedom and liberty and worship does not do away with spiritual order and authority. That word is over and over and over again in this letter. There's an order. God is an orderly God. And one, number one, the manner in which you respond to the direction of those in charge reveals the nature of your spirit and the source of your action. Does it hackle you a little bit? Does the hair on the back of your neck get a little, what does he mean? He can't be talking about me. <laughs> Don't go there. Don't go there. Amen. How we respond to that person in authority tells a lot about ourselves, right? Number two, the Holy Ghost will never inspire rebellion or disrespect. These are both elements of flesh, 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 out of control. Number three, regardless of what we are doing in worship, we must follow the leadership of our spiritual authority. A, if, if the leader feels it's the time to change the order of the service because he or she is being led by the Holy Ghost, and we got to flow with that in the leader's direction and submit our emotions or personal feelings to the direction of those who would lead us. Now, they, they could be wrong, but our job is still to follow them, right? All right? Well, not, not to judge them. Not to, as long as they're in the word, we follow them. All right? They're doing the best they can. We, we all make mistakes spiritually, right? So just follow them, all right? B, put confidence in those who lead you and trust their judgment and discernment in things of God. That's why we have a pastor. That's why we have spiritual authorities in our life. Praise God. So, number three, in conclusion, worship, worship, worship. 
is a prevailing theme that's found throughout God's word. Worship was practiced before the creation of humanity, right? The angels worshiped. They sang, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And it would be a prominent activity through all of eternity. When we get to heaven, we're going to be singing, holy, holy, holy. I'm going to be saying, how did I ever get here? <laughs> Isn't God good? <laughs> Isn't God good? Oh, to him be the glory, right? Worship is a recognition of the ultimate reality. It acknowledges the supremacy of God and the deficiencies of humanity of you and me, all our failings, all our shortcomings, and in spite of it, he still has a plan. In spite of it, he still loves us. In spite of us, he still died for us and once saved us, right? It's not abnormal to worship. In fact, not to worship is abnormal. People who can come to the presence of God and not be moved. There's something wrong with them. There's something wrong with them. That you can't be moved by the presence of God. We, we ought to get very small in the presence of God, right? He is God and I will never be God. Praise God. Worship is the supreme purpose of humanity. We were created to worship him. Praise and worship should permeate every area of our life. Thanking God. I play pickleball with these people, and they comment, you always have a smile on your face. It's almost like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> they can't remember my name, but they said, you always got a smile on your face. Our prayers should be saturated with praise. Our work and our exercise of talents should be offerings of praise. What I do, I do unto the Lord and give him the glory. Our commitment to discipleship bringing discipline into our lives. I've chosen to do these things and I've chosen not to do these things because I'm trying to be formed in the image of Christ. Our work and our exercise and talents should be offerings of praise. Our commitment to discipleship should be motivated by sincere desire to glorify God's majesty. He made it all. He made it all. He made it all. Every church service should be a celebration of our experience and relationship with God. When we come in here, we ought to enter his gates with thanksgiving and say, Woo! I made it! I made it! Another week behind me. I'm one step closer to my eternal reward, right? The greatest need in the church today is for people who truly worship God. People won't understand it. I mean, it's talked about, I, I don't know, I've, I've thought about this. The Bible, Christianity as a whole, I think it's the only one that I know of that makes fun of itself. Paul said it's the foolishness of preaching. He acknowledges how crazy this concept is to the outside world. But it's the foolishness of preaching that saves people. And we're either you can become fools or we are not. I'm a fool for Christ, Right? So we come to worship him, not just with our mouth, but with our hearts. And when a church congregation learns to offer pure and sincere worship to God, they open a door to spiritual blessings. True apostolic worship assists in bringing revival. I've never been in a spirit-anointed service that didn't begin with worship. Praise. And we stand. Praise God. Praise God. Have you enjoyed these lessons? Did you learn anything? Did you take any notes? Are you keeping these in a binder? God is so good. God is so good. Let's close in prayer tonight. Heavenly Father, we love you tonight. We declare your righteousness. We declare your power. We declare your goodness today. Teach us how to worship. Teach us how to love you, to love our neighbors as ourselves, to be living epistles read of all men that you might receive the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' precious name we pray. And everyone said amen. amen. You're dismissed. We'll see you Sunday morning. Amen.